This report stated that the alert had been ordered by the chief of the Soviet Air Forces, Marshal Kutukov, and that all units of the Soviet Wolves Air Army were involved in the alert. This included preparations for immediate use of nuclear weapons. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app or join our emailing list at coldwarconversations.com. In 1986, Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev said, Never perhaps in the post-war decades has the situation in the world been explosive and hence more difficult and unfavourable as in the first half of the 1980s. He was referring to a period of immense tension between the Soviet Union and NATO when in 1983 a NATO exercise called Able Archer was believed to have almost accidentally started World War III. We delve into the Able Archer archives to talk about the most recent documents with Francesca Akhtar, a researcher whose main research interests are US Cold War foreign policy, intelligence history and defence. Francesca has written a dissertation entitled The Most Dangerous Soviet-American Confrontation Since the Cuban Missile Crisis, an analysis of the origins, nature and impact of the Abel Archer 83 incident. Regular listeners will remember that Francesca talked about Abel Archer previously in episode 19. The battle to preserve Cold War history is ongoing and your support can provide me with the ammunition to continue to keep this podcast on the air. Via a simple monthly donation, you'll become one of our community and get a sought-after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a thank you and you'll bask in the warm glow of knowing that you're helping to preserve Cold War history. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. I'm Tim from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I support the Cold War Conversations podcast financially because of the great research and the quality of the storytelling. If a monthly contribution is not your cup of tea, we also welcome one-off donations via coldwarconversations.com slash donate. I'm delighted to welcome back Francesca Akhtar to our Cold War conversation. Abel Archer was um, a NATO wargaming exercise that it was an annual exercise that that took place in November. And it, it, it's taken place in previous years without sort of incident. Um, however, in 1983, because of the, the general state of tensions between the West and uh, the Soviet Union, particularly relations with the United States, it caused well, this is the view of some historians, and me included, but uh, that it caused the Soviet Union to think that the exercise was actually a cover for um, a surprise attack by the West. And that was because in 1983, there were some quite significant changes to the exercise um, that were implemented that hadn't occurred uh, in previous years. And taken together with the, the tensions with the US, this caused the Soviets to think that the US was, was planning to attack. If you look at the wider backdrop of, and, the, and the context in which this took place, you had a period where relations had really deteriorated, particularly between the US and the Soviet Union. That was sparked partly by the uh, election of President Reagan, um, his rhetoric towards the Soviet Union, uh, his, his, his name of the Soviet Union as the evil empire that infuriated the Soviet Union, particularly Andrew Pulse, who was, who was the leader at the time, who was already pretty paranoid. I just want to clear up a few misconceptions uh, because often, um, when, when I've seen Abel Archer referred to, even in mainstream newspaper articles, often they, uh, a journalist will get the details muddled up so they will refer to everything as Abel Archer. It's it's not true that, because uh, I saw one article, I think it was in The Guardian, saying that this airlift of soldiers was part of Abel Archer and it was part of the reason that that year in 83 it sparked this paranoia that uh, the Buck said, that's not actually correct because this, this airlift of soldiers was part of the refugee exercise which actually took place before Abel Archer. 
And we saw um 83 was an, a, another exercise um, and it stands for the return of forces to Germany. So that particular exercise was war gaming, um, stimulating an attack uh, that the Warsaw Pact had invaded Germany. So that was um, role played with actually, actually real troops. But this airlift that did take place in Reforger was thought to have possibly spooked the Soviets because it took place in complete radio silence. And this is actually one of their own indicators, one of the Soviet indicators in their own military doctrine that this could be an indication that an enemy country, i.e. Um, the US or NATO ally, could be um, preparing to, for a war. But there were also other changes that included the practice of new nuclear weapons release procedures. Because the Soviets were monitoring the exercise and they, and they had monitored the exercise in previous years. And as I said, you know, that, that there was not this heightened state of fear. But, but in 83, um, the US Air Force during Abel Archer practiced, and I'm quoting here from one of the reports, had practiced the nuclear warhead procedures, which including taxiing out of hangars, carrying realistic looking dummy warheads. And so the, the, probably the most comprehensive assessment that we have to date of Abel Archer was released in 2015. Um, by the um, President's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board in the US. And they, and in, in their conclusions, they say that these changes caused the Soviet Union to mount an unprecedented um, response. And so that's why, particularly in 83, all these factors combined to produce this reaction. You've also got the context in 83 of the shooting down of KAL 007. The- that's right. Korean airliner over the Sakhalin Peninsula, and also the Americans were carrying out exercises in the Sea of Okutsk, a sea that was generally thought of by the Soviets to be their their own backyard. And uh, I think the U.S. Navy were actually did actually overfly Soviet territory at one point, which um, obviously didn't go down too well, and sort of made the um, the Soviets even more jittery, and that could well have caused the uh, shooting down of the Korean airliner. Yes, I mean, definitely the shooting down of KAL caused a huge diplomatic incident. And I think that was September 83, so literally a couple of months um, before any election. You have a situation where when the Cuban Missile Crisis happened, uh, although that was that's thought to be one of the most serious incidents, but it, but it took place in a different context. Um, you know, it was it was public. It was something that was public at the time, so everybody knew it was happening. And I think, in a way, that that put more pressure on the leaders because they weren't being watched by the world to to kind of make sure that they reached a, a, a solution. But also, relations between the U.S. and the Soviet Union hadn't reached the very low point that they had by ninety three. And I think, although uh, Kennedy um, and Khrushchev might have. You know, they did have very different views. Um, they might not have agreed with each other's political stance, but I think they, they respected each other, even if they didn't necessarily agree. I don't think that was the case by the time you get to 83. And, and actually in this report, that the one that I just mentioned that was released in 2015, the board actually says that by um, 1983, US-Soviet relations had reached their lowest end probably in um, 20 years. The the documents that we we were going to talk about today are, are further documents that have been released since 2015. Do you want to just give an introduction into the uh, the first one that we want to cover? Yes. So since 2015, there haven't been any releases at all, as far as I'm aware, regarding Abel Archer either on uh, the US side or the UK side. I had been I had been very frustrated, particularly. With, on the UK side, I had I have submitted a couple of Freedom of Information Act requests um, to try and get hold of some new documents that that I saw that had been recently added to the uh, National Archives um, database. So the first release we have was a UK file, a Foreign Office file that was released in March of 2020, and then almost exactly a year later in February last year, we had probably the more significant release because it contains a lot more information on the US side. And for me, it's very exciting because this is 
a letter. One of one of these documents is a letter written by somebody who was actually directly involved in the incident. And um, so I'll go I'll go through all that. And we have a couple of NSA NSA messages that have been released for the first time, and also a couple of CIA reports. So I think um, if we start with the UK, the UK really first. Just to sum up sort of the, the, where we are with the, the state of the UK archives as, as regards Abel Archer, we don't have as much on the UK side as has been released in the US. And um, as I think we've talked about in the first episode, that's, that's partly because we have a very different system in the UK. We don't release as much um, as the US does. Our Freedom of Information Act is, is a lot more restrictive than in America and our intelligence agencies are, are actually exempt from our FOIA. And so it's 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 a tougher it's a tougher job to try and get information released. So we had in 2013, I think it's about 10 documents that were released by the Ministry of Defense. And these were obtained by an independent researcher um, who submitted a request for them. And they're probably the the most detailed uh, story we have on the UK side. And those documents really talked about the influence of the role of the British government and um, the influence influence of the Thatcher government in alerting Reagan administration after the event of the incident that Abel Archer could have caused. And they were fantastic because we, we really didn't have that before. Since then, there has been nothing else. And um, I, have, I have submitted a request to try and get hold of, it's the equivalent basically of the US report. It's the major intelligence assessment of the Joint Intelligence Committee, which is, it's a committee that um, part of the cabinet office um, was set up to, it, it basically monitors threats. It also provides intelligence oversight functions and um, assessments and advisors to the Prime Minister and the cabinet office um, about intelligence matters. And so because it, it's technically not an intelligence agency like MI5 or MI6, meaning it would be exempt, it's actually part of the government Department, i.e., the cabinet office, you can, in in theory, make a request for it. But I I have tried Nate Jones um, of the National Security Archive, who is who I who I always call the Abel Archer Guru because he's really the the person that started it all, and and it's due to him and the work of the uh, National Security Archive that we have the the document that we have. Everybody owes them a great deal of thanks, but he tried to get hold of this. Uh, report in, I, I believe it was 2014, 2015, he was refused. And I, and I think it, the, the reason given was actual security. I tried in around 2019, same thing, refused on the grounds of national security. So uh, that's, that continues to be withheld. And it, it's a great source of frustration to many of us. But this document um, that was released, um, yeah, so it was released in March of 2020, just when COVID and lockdowns were, were hitting everybody. Um, and so because of that and the fact that the National Archives closed and then, you know, surprise to while, and even when they reopened, uh, they didn't reopen normally for quite a while. So the number of visitors were restricted. So I didn't get to actually see it until October last year. I went up there. Being quite cynical at this point, given the number of requests I've had turned out, I didn't really expect it to contain anything particularly groundbreaking or explosive because I thought that they probably wouldn't have released it otherwise. But I thought it might add some interesting detail. And it does. It's 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 not a very big um, file. It contains basically two pages of uh, correspondence. And um, it basically discusses the cancellation of the exercise. And this is in um, April of 1990. And so... We understand from the correspondence that um, actually it was the, the Germans that were sort of behind the effort to cancel the um, exercise. I guess the context with that, though, is that, you know, the Germans are looking towards reunification at this point and therefore don't see the point in exercises and also the danger that an exercise might. I don't know, upset the, the Soviets and them, you know, renege on uh, whatever agreements had been made around reunification. Yes, I mean, I'm guessing that's probably why we're heading to the Cold War now. Um, 
But it's not a surprise to me, actually, that the UK seems still in favour of, of, of carrying it on and are disappointed that it can't, because this actually links back to these documents that were released in 2013, where you have a lot of discussion about um, the fact that the UK still thinks, I mean, this is in the 1984, so it's uh, a few years um, before, but they are still saying that even given the scare that happened, the, U- the British still saw value in having the exercise and some of the documents discuss ways in which they could reduce the likelihood of misunderstanding misunderstanding in the future. So it seems that the UK was always pretty um, in favour of this exercise. In the context of 1990, the Intermediate Range uh, Nuclear Forces Treaty had been signed by then. So the Warsaw Pact could have observers of NATO exercises, but I don't. I just wonder whether they would be able to have observers of something like Able Archer because that is more communications based rather than troops and tanks moving around the country. Yeah, that's a very good point, and um, I don't know because actually the answer. I mean, I do know that that the exercise, you know, it was very highly classified for a long time, and public, even public knowledge of the fact that it existed only kind of started to leak out in towards the end of the 80s, early 90s. So now there's a bit of a mystery with this boulder in that um, there's supposed to be actually another document in it. Um, And I think it's the note that they referred to in the first letter, the note that was supposed to be cast to the ambassador. I think that's the document they're referring to. When I was looking at the file in the archives, um, where the document, instead of having the actual document, there was an insert um, saying that the document had been removed and destroyed by foreign office staff in August of 2019. And um, that's not unusual to find. Um, so often um, when you're when you're looking in the UK archives, sometimes it, there will be in that, particularly if you have some a file that has many, some of it has been released, but some of it um, has been retained. But Usually, I mean, I've never come across that, this particular case. I have come across cases where it says, uh, this particular page has been retained, um, under section 3.3b or something of the, of the, of the legislation under which, um, information can be legally exempted. But this one I, I thought was a bit strange because it didn't say why. And I had, I hadn't seen that before. Uh, it just said destroy. So, uh, when I, when I inquired at the desk, uh, with the archivist, they said um, it could be that the foreign office had retained it for national security reasons, and so that I needed to contact them um, because they might have a, you know, they might have a copy in their in their department, and that I could possibly submit um, another Freedom of Information Act uh, request separately for that particular document. So I did contact them, and um, they came back to me and said that, uh, they did not have another copy. And they basically said that it it was standard procedure um, to destroy documents such as this when there was a copy that existed elsewhere, basically because it wasn't um, a foreign office document. It was a NATO document. But then, this is what they said, that, that the standard procedure and that I needed to contact NATO. So I did contact NATO um, and they were very helpful. They came back to me about four weeks later and said that they had searched uh, their archives, different partners in their archives, um, they should find no reference to this document. And so we don't know much about the document. We just know that it's a native document and there was just a number given. Um, we don't know anything more about that. And the date of the documents was the 4th of April 1990. And that particular document is, is probably lost unless there's a copy floating around somewhere else. But I, I doubt it very much, unfortunately. The other document that I actually that popped up that I noticed in the archives um, a few years ago, around sort of 2019, I noticed that there was another one that seemed to have been recently added to uh, the UK archives. And initially, when I saw it, it said um, it was called, it was a foreign office file, and it was called an um, Nuclear Weapons Release Procedures, Able Archer 83. And so obviously that immediately grabbed my attention. Um, I submitted it. It was, it said it was closed and retained by the Foreign Office. So, um, I submitted a request for that, was turned down. 
on the grounds of national security again. And I appealed and was also turned down. But actually, it seems that there was some sort of a mix up because when they replied to me, they said, oh, actually, that's not correct. It's not the document isn't to do with Able Archer 83. It's actually to do with Able Archer 86. So there must have been some sort of um, mix up uh, when it was um, the entry was made in the catalogue in the um, National Archives catalogue. That has been now corrected. So if you go and look it up, it does actually say 86. So that was refused, but um, I was I was looking it up again recently, and I noticed that in the entry, and I'm sure that this has been added recently because I don't remember actually seeing it before. Often, when you look up a document, it will tell you if it's closed. It sometimes tells you how long it's closed for. It's retained. Um, sometimes it says for fifty years or but depending. Now it says reconsideration due in 2027. So. That's not that long now. So that, that, that suggests that they will look at it again and review whether in another five years, whether um, that can be released. In the February State Department release, there are some revealing documents, aren't there? So just to give some background to this, one of the main documents in this release is a letter written by uh, somebody called Leonard Perutz, who was a lieutenant general in the Air Force, and he was actually directly involved in Able Archer. He was in the Air Force at the time, and he was stationed at the U.S. Um, Air Force Base in Ramstein, which, um, as well as being the uh, U.S. Air Force Base, it was also actually the headquarters of one of the NATO commands. It was the um, Allied Air Forces, Central Europe Command of NATO. So when Abel Archer happened, he was the uh, deputy chief of staff for intelligence at Ramstein. His name has only been connected to Abel Archer recently. Um, and it, it, his name was only re- um, really known about when this US report was released in 2015. And it actually named him as being probably the reason that the uh, exercise ended without incident because his boss when they saw that the uh, Russians had raised the alert of bull, asked him for his advice of what, what, what to do. So he actually advised not to raise the US alert level. The report of the board actually identifies this as, as probably being one of the reasons that the event ended without incident and then eventually the Soviets reduced their alert level. In this report, it mentions that he wrote... Um, a letter when he retired from the intelligence community. He wrote a letter saying that he was really unhappy with the way that the intelligence community had misread the situation and had not really taken the Abel Archer incident seriously because it was thought that it wasn't really a threat on the part of the Soviet Union. A lot of analysts in the CIA, um, also some members of the Reagan administration, thought it was, it was Soviet propaganda. To, to try and actually delay the deployment of the Pershing missiles um, by pissing out this propaganda. They didn't really see it as a threat. And he really disagreed with this view. So he writes this letter, but we didn't have access to this letter. And Nate Jones, now at the Washington Post, he tried to get hold of this letter. I believe he um, fired the DIA actually for it. And uh, I was told that they didn't have a record of it. And I believe he was actually pursuing legal action to try and get this uh, letter or this, this report. And it was kind of out of the blue that this, le- this letter was actually released in February last year. But kind of interesting twist is that it actually wasn't released by the DIA, who I believe still continue to claim you know, they have no record of it. It was released in um, a State Department volume along with some other same documents relating to um, that period. So we have that letter, which I'll go into a bit more detail in a moment. We also have, for the first time, a release, um, a National Intelligence Daily Bulletin, talking about the fact that, and this is dated when the, when the um, exercise was actually going on. So this is dated November 10th, 83. For those that don't know, the, the National Intelligence Daily is, is published by uh, the CIA 
and it's published by their director of intelligence. And it's basically a compilation of um, key items of intelligence um, that published and obviously to the president and officials within the government. And it's published six days a week. And so this was has not been seen before. And it basically says that the Soviet air units in East Germany were put on alert. And again, I'll get to that in a minute. And then the other document we have, which is very interesting, is actually a CIA memo commenting on to Roots's letter um, written by an analyst in the CIA's Soviet Affairs Office. We don't have their names, who they actually were, because that they were redacted. Probably, I'm guessing, because they'd they must, they must um, be alive. But they really add a lot of um, interesting detail. So, um, yeah, where, where do you want to start? Well, let's start with the Perutz letter and what he says right. okay. about, because this is, this, is, this is a letter that he wrote uh, at his retirement where he obviously felt he had nothing to lose by saying it as he saw it. That's right. And so to give you a little bit of context of Perutz, by the, at the time of Abel Archie, he'd had almost a 30-year career in uh, Air Force intelligence in various positions. He'd served um, not only in the US, he'd served, um, he was in Vietnam, he was a, he was a Vietnam veteran. Um, so he, was, he, was, he served in several different positions. Uh, so he, he had a lot of experience. Um, this wasn't somebody who was a uh, you know, 25-year-old who didn't know what they were doing. He was a very seasoned, experienced um, officer. He's long been a person of interest for me because not only regarding Abel Archer, um, but because two years after Abel Archer, he goes on to become the director of the Defence Intelligence Agency, which is uh, coincidentally happens to be uh, the subject of my PhD. And so, and I'm, and I'm actually writing a chapter about his time at the moment. So I focus on him quite a bit. Anyway, he writes this, um, this called an end of tour report. Uh, in in the form of a letter, and it's it's very very detailed, and it's fantastic because it's really the only public record we have of his comment. Because as I said, his name was only made public in 2015. Unfortunately, he was at the time he was quite ill. Um, he was already in his 80s, and um, I think Nate Jones tried to get an interview with him, but he was he was already quite ill, and then he died in 2017. So this is fantastic to have because it's one of the few accounts we have of somebody who is actually directly involved in Abel Archer. He retires in December 1988 and the letter is dated January 89. But people can read that online because it's all available online after. So I'll just pick out a few bits. Yeah, and I'll make sure there's links in the episode notes to uh, these documents. So he says that in 1983, I was assigned as the DCS, the Deputy Chief um, of Staff for Intelligence at the US Air Forces in Europe. He says the annual NATO command and control exercise, Abel Archer, was scheduled to begin during the first week of November. The context of this nuclear command and control exercise was relatively benign. The scenario had been purposefully chosen to be non-controversial and the exercise itself was a routine annual event. And he says, um, as I recall, however, there was no particular feeling of tension in the European theatre beyond that which is normal. Uh, and he says, only the fact that Soviet intelligence collection assets, primarily low-level signals, interceptor units, had failed to return to garrison after their normal coverage of NATO's Autumn Forge exercise series could be reckoned strange at all. Um, and he says, as the kickoff date of Abel Archer neared, it was clear that there was a great deal of Soviet interest in the forthcoming events. Uh, again, this seemed nothing out of the ordinary. We knew that there was a history of intense Soviet collection against practice emergency action messages related to nuclear release. So this is the type of thing that would be practiced in a command post exercise such as Abel Archer. And yeah, so he says that, yeah, we weren't really worried about it. We, we, you know, we knew that the Soviets knew about the exercise. It had taken place in previous years with no, with no incident. Um, we knew that they monitored it. Um, which is something that the report also mentions. And so at that point, he really, you know, didn't think that there would be anything out of the ordinary. 
Now, what's really interesting about his report is that he also refers to some NSA messages, which which we have not had um, released before, which kind of like up, what, you what, know, really in his view. So he says that Abel Archer started in the morning of the 3rd of November. Some accounts give the start date of Abel Archer as the 2nd of November. Some give it as the 3rd. But anyway, he, according to him, it started the 3rd. And it says, and progressed immediately in the scenario to NATO state orange. So that's basically when in the fictional scenario that um, the Warsaw Pact has invaded um, several countries in Eastern Europe. And so they role play that they then use chemical weapons against NATO allies. Um, and so the, the, um, the conflict escalates from a conventional sort of land-based uh, war to um, an attack using biological, well, what was role-played as biological chemical and um, And so he says, on the 4th of November, the NSA issued a report saying that Soviet air forces in Germany were placed on heightened readiness on the 2nd of November. And what's really interesting is he says that I saw this message on the morning of the 5th of November and, just, and discussed it with my analysts. It stated that, that as of 7 o'clock on um, on the 2nd of November, the fighter bomber divisions of the Air Force of Greek Soviet forces Germany had been placed in the status of heightened alert. Um, and he says all divisional and regimental command posts and supporting command and control elements were to be manned around the clock. In addition to this, um, that these reports stated that these aircraft were to be armed and placed at a 30 minute alert ready to destroy first line enemy targets. And so this is kind of, you know, something that's not been, uh, released before, but it, it, it backs up a lot of what's said by the report later on. And uh, just to, just to make clear, although the Perutz letter, because it was only released last February, it was actually written before the report. So he writes this letter in 89 to these, uh, to the board and this sparks a lot of concern and, and really prompts them to reopen an investigation. And then they produce this report almost two years later and in November 1990. And we don't have time to go into the report because it's like over 100 pages. But again, that's online for people want to read that. But they, you know, they confirm a lot of what at the time he is, he is not sure about, like he's thinking, you know, that this is my feeling because he didn't actually have access to a lot of information that definitively told him what was going on. He says he discussed this with his air analysts and that they, they took it to mean that this could be, this could mean that they were, these aircraft in East Germany were actually loading, it, he says, a war load. So pairing for possibly preemptive strike. And so then he mentions the fact that he, he spoke to his commander and he says, I told him we had some unusual activity in East Germany that was probably a reaction to the ongoing Abel Archer. He asked if I thought we should increase real force generation. I said that we would carefully watch the situation, but that there was insufficient evidence to justify increasing our real alert posture. Um, and he says, at this point in the exercise, our forces were in a simu simulated posture of NATO state orange, which, as I said, was like simulated um, uh, nuclear thing from the tab. And then he says, um, the other interesting thing, which I don't, I don't think has been uh, mentioned before also, is that there were other exercises also going on at Ramstein, which I think were, were connected to Abel Archer, but that were, that were air force exercises and they're called salt. I have no idea who comes up with these names, but they're quite funny. Salty nation test. Um, and these were U.S. air force exercises that were conducted to, um, test the ability of Air Force Base to survive a nuclear attack. So that makes sense They would um, that they were going on at Ramstein where um, uh, he was monitoring Abel Archer. So it seems to be tied in together. But what's significant is that he says, if I had known then what I later found out, I am uncertain what advice I would have given. So he's basically saying that I didn't really know for sure that you know, what exactly was going on because he was only given this information later on. And if I had known that the Soviets had this, that they were basically moving to a walled footing, he's kind of implying that maybe I would have erased the that level. So that could have then ended 
disastrously. And so, just to kind of summarise the rest of it, he then goes on to mention another NSA message, which was dated in December, so after the exercise had finished. And he says, this provided the rest of the picture as far as we knew it. And he says, this message was entitled, Soviet Force Air Army at Heightened Readiness in Reaction to NATO Exercise Able Archer. Now, this is really, really important because this is really proof that actually they were moving to a war footing. Um, and this is new information. And so he says, this report stated that the alert had been ordered by the chief of the Soviet Air Forces, Marshal Kutikov, and that all units of the Soviet Wolf's Air Army were involved in the alert. And then he quote, which says, this included preparations for immediate use of nuclear weapons. So, and this is, this is a backed up by what the conclusion and the finding of the um, President's Board report later on that say, according to what they find, it's not just that the Soviets uh, thought that the US, the West was, was preparing to strike them. It's that they were actively moving to a, floor, a war footing, possibly in order to mount the preemptive strike first. But he says that um, this report described activity that was contemporaneous with that reflected in East Germany, but because of the specific source of this material, it was not available in near real time. So they didn't get the information until after, a lot of the information until after the threat had died away. And then he basically says that um, equally ominous was the fact that Abel Archer happened or what nearly happened kind of reflects badly on the intelligence, the INW system, which is the intelligence, which is intelligence and warning. Sometimes it's called indications and warning, but it's a uh, system whereby that, that the US had in place to detect possible threats if somebody was planning to attack. Um, he says that he didn't get this information in time. And so he says, although then they got some information later, they didn't get it at the time, so they didn't really know what was going on. And he said when they did get an indicator that there were, a warning was raised on the night of November when, he says, overhead photography had shown fully armed aircraft on alert, on air defence alert at this base in East Germany. But he says when this single indicator was raised, the stand down had been underway for a week. So it raises issues about the fact that they were not getting adequate information at the time. When he says that I'm not sure I, I might have made a different decision. And this is what leads the uh, report later on to call his decision not to raise the alert level and a, a fortuitous, if ill informed decision. And that's kind of what they're referring to. So it's more by luck than judgment that n the escalation doesn't go any further on on the Soviet side. Um, incredible. Do do you have any indication as to how much British intelligence was getting real time from Gordievsky at, at this point? Um, but he does actually mention only Gordievsky. He says that. He said, our problem here was that we, as in the US, had a couple of very highly classified bits of intelligent evidence about a potentially disastrous situation that never actually came to fruition. For decision makers, it was always difficult to believe that there could have been any serious reaction by the Soviets. But from the Soviet perspective, however, it might have appeared very different. And he said, it was very difficult for all of us, and I think he means within the intelligence community, to grasp that. That he said, but Oleg Gordievsky's reporting began to provide a somewhat frightening perspective when it became available in the fall of 1985. I, I'm not sure. I know that there were British signals intelligence reports, apparently, but they're still classified. And we know that these British Ministry of Defence documents discuss the fact that you know uh, the, the evidence, um, not the evidence, came from Gordievsky. And by 1984, by sort of March 1984, the, the board report notes that the issue of the war scare had been broken into the US and the UK relationship. But that, um, he, he kind of actually goes on to say that what's significant about what he says is that he says, by the time Gordievsky's reporting began to surface for analytical review, 
I was the director of DIA. So this is, he was, he became director in October 85. And he says, um, Gordievsky's initial reporting about a war scare in 83 immediately caught my attention. There are some academic and some, some researchers who don't believe that this was really a scare. So, you know, that, that it wasn't a genuine scare. And sometimes they cite the fact that Gordievsky, um, didn't know any, you know, didn't know about Avalanche, but, but, but he didn't know it by that turn. But he, he did give information about the fact that the, the Soviets were paranoid about searching for evidence of a surprise attack. And this, a lot of the information about Operation Rian, which, which was the collection program they had to search for evidence in the West that the West was planning to attack them. And they'd had this program since 81 and a lot of that information came from him. But some historians have taken that to mean that, well, there wasn't really a scare. It was all fine. But so, and he, he mentioned, he mentions exactly this. But he says, beginning in 82 and continuing in 83, Gordievsky says that this kind of route of this issues in um, Moscow became ever more insistent than a, that an attack was being planned um, by the West. But we, we still don't have access to the um, British signals intelligence report. I'm not sure if that we probably will or not, but not well, in time. What about the, the Soviet side? Obviously, I completely recognise it would be a challenge at the moment, but certainly at the end of the Cold War, was there any access to any of this information or even to that Soviet Air Force general who raised the alert level? As far as I know, the the Russian, the Soviet Russian side is still closed, um, the ar- archive elite. I, I, I think I remember reading that, um, and Nate Jones, I think, blogged about this, the Ukrainian archives had started to open up. I think he visited there. But I, as far as I know, the Russian side, I think, pretty much still closed. I mean, the only kind of other information we have that discusses the Soviet reaction, we, we have some from the East German um, archives. Karut says in his report, Gordievsky uh, says that he never really believed in the threat. But um, reported during his debriefing by the British in 85 that he thought the Ryan hysteria might have been some kind of an internal political ploy. Um, but he says, I, he, he, he states strongly that I must reiterate again that Gordievsky didn't know about the secret military alert for November 83. So there was information that he didn't know either. And he, what he really, he closes the letter but really by saying that criticizing the US intelligence community, saying that they have never really closed with this analytical problem. And he says that, so after the event, there were, there were, um, two main national intelligence estimates produced by the CIA. Um, they're produced by the CIA, but they have input from other intelligence agencies that the position had been taken and again and again, that had there been a real alert, we would have detected more of it. But he says this may be whistling through the graveyard. It's not certain that we looked hard enough or broadly enough for information. For Western collectors, the context was peacetime without even the most basic ripples of crisis. For the Soviets, however, the view may have looked quite different. It's uncertain how close to war we came or even if that was a possibility at all. Uh, but we know from Gordievsky that analysts in Moscow had predicted that the West would launch the attack of a posture of NATO state orange. And he says, what might, uh, he ends by saying, what might have happened that day in November 83 if we had begun a cautionary generation of forces rather than waiting uh, for further information? It, and, and, and this is what the board uh, writes about in their findings is that there seemed to be a split in, in, on the Russian side between the analysts who were the KGB assets who were um, resident abroad who were tasked with sending back intelligence who didn't really think that, you know, that, that there was this great threat. But because of the fact that Andropov was, was, was completely paranoid and they were this kind of cadre of officials in Moscow he was paranoid about about an attack from the West. And, um, you know, these, these are people that had been around, some of them, in the Second World War, and they remember the surprise attack of, of the Germans. And this is where a lot of their military doctrine since then came from. This is what they based it around, this, this, this constant fear of, of, a, of a surprise attack because of what had happened before. Sure. 
So what Andrew Pop was doing, he was he was tasking these agents abroad to collect all this intelligence, but he was not interested in actually also receiving the analysis that went with it to properly be able to interpret the, the um, intelligence that he was receiving. And that plays a big part in it as well. It's almost as though if you're looking for something going on, you will interpret things in certain ways to justify the fact that you think something is going on. Um, that's probably not the most eloquent way of, of describing it. This program that they had, um, which, I, which, we, which we talked about um, in more detail in the first episode, but um, so this, this collection program that we had, so some of their indicators were, you know, you know it sounds quite funny today, um, but so some of the, the indicators they were tasked with watching for that could indicate surprise attack, for example, was the number of lights in government buildings late at night. So... In London, for example, they were tasked to watch the number of light on in government buildings in white or late at night. Um, kind of missing the point that that could just be cleaners, you know. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that governments are planning for an attack and also monitoring the price of um, blood donation, you know, at bank. We're also missing the point that in the UK, um, it's actually a voluntary. People are paid. And so these kind of indicators were very skewed. Was Bricksmith and the other Allied military liaison units in East Germany providing any data as to what they were seeing on the ground? Or is that files that have uh, yet to be released? Um, I don't know is the answer. I haven't really focused on Bricksmith. I didn't look at that at all during uh, when I wrote my, my thesis. I, I, I basically looked at um, it was mainly the US um, response. So I actually don't know, but that's an interesting question. But maybe somebody listening may be able to answer. Yes. So if you were with Bricksmiths or any of the other Allied military liaison missions and you were operating in East Germany in November of 1983, did you see any heightened alert indicators when you were there? We'd love to know. Yes, definitely. Um, that's a very good question. Don't miss the episode extras such as videos, photos and other content. Just look for the link in the podcast information. The podcast wouldn't exist without the generous support of our financial supporters and I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping the podcast on the road. If you'd like to help the project, just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. The Cold War Conversation continues in our Facebook discussion group. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thanks very much for listening and see you next week. Thanks for listening right through to the end. I really appreciate it. And maybe check out our store and see if you can find the ideal gift for the Cold War enthusiast in your life. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash store. Thanks for listening.